Hello, everyone. Going to do a recording on the sermon from Martin Luther for Christmas Eve from the year 1522 that he that he wrote down, which was after the Reformation, but before he even wrote the small catechism and the large catechism, and even before the Augsburg Confession was written. Let's put it in kind of a time frame of when this was this was created. But it says uh, Martin Luther, a sermon of my Martin Luther taken from his church postal in 1522. So I hope you enjoy it this Christmas Eve. We Let's go ahead and begin. The appearing of the grace of God. It is written in the book of Nehemiah that the Jews in rebuilding Jerusalem wrought with one hand and with one other held the sword because of the enemy who sought to hinder the building. Paul in Titus 1.9 carries out this thought of the symbol in this teaching that a bishop, a pastor, or preacher should be mighty in the Holy Scriptures to instruct and admonish as well, as to resist the gainsayers. Accordingly, we are to make a twofold use of the word of God as both bread and weapon for feeding and for resisting in peace and in war. With one hand, we must build, improve, teach, and feed all Christendom. With the other, oppose the devil the heretics, the world, for wherever the pasture is not defended, the devil will soon destroy it. He is bitterly opposed to God's word. Let us then, God granting us his grace, so handle the gospel that not only shall the souls of men be fed, but the men shall learn to put on that gospel as armor and fight their enemies. Thus shall it furnish both pasture and weapons. The first consideration in this lesson is, Paul teaches what should be the theme of Titus and of every other preacher, namely Christ. The people are to be taught who Christ is, why he came, and what blessings his coming brought us. The grace of God hath appeared, the apostle says, meaning God's grace is clearly manifest. How was it manifested? By the preaching of the apostles, it was proclaimed worldwide. Previous to Christ's resurrection, the grace of God was unre unrevealed. Christ dwelt only among the Jews and was not yet glorified. But after his ascension, he gave to men the Holy Spirit. Concerning the Spirit, he before testified that the Spirit of truth, whom he should send, would glorify him. The apostles' meaning is, Christ did not come to dwell on earth for his own advantage, but for our good. Therefore, he did not retain his goodness and grace within himself. After his ascension, he caused them to be proclaimed in public, preaching throughout the world to all men. Nor did he permit the revelation to be made as mere proclamation of a fact, as a rumor or a report. It was appointed to bring forth fruit in us, it is a revelation and proclamation that teaches us to deny, to reject ungodly things, all earthly lusts, all worldly desires, and then, and thenceforward, lead a sober, righteous, and godly life. In the first verse, the true essence of the text, the grace of God hath appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Paul condemns the favors of the world and of men as pernicious, worthy of condemnation, ineffectual, and would incite us a desire for divine grace. He teaches us to despise human favor. He who would have God's grace and favor must consider the surrender of all other grace and favor. Christ said, You shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. The psalmist says, God hath scattered the bones of him that campeth against thee, Paul declares, if I were still pleasing men, I should not be a servant of Christ. Where saving grace of God comes, the perniscuous favor must be ignored. He who would taste the former must reject and forget the latter. 
According to the text, this grace has appeared, is proclaimed to all men. Christ commanded that the gospel be preached, preached to all creatures throughout the whole world. And Paul, in many places, for instance, Colossians 1.3 says, The gospel which he heard preached in all creation under heaven. The, the thought is, the gospel is preached publicly in the hearing of all creatures, much more of all men. At first Christ preached the gospel and, not, and only in the land of the Jews. Knowledge of the Holy Scriptures being confined to that nation. But afterward, the word was made free to all men, not confined to any particular section. Psalm 19.4 declares, Their line is gone through the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. This is spoken of the apostles. But you may object. Surely the words of the apostles did not in their time reach the end of the world. For nearly 800 years, elapsed after the apostolic age before Germany was converted. And also recent discoveries show that there are many islands and many countries where no indication of the grace of God appeared before the century. I reply, the apostle has reference to character of the gospel. Its message calculated from the nature of its inception and purpose to go into all the world. At the time of the apostles, it had already entered the greater and better part of the world. Up to that day, no message of like character was ever ordained. The law of Moses was confined to Jewish nation. Universal proclamation of the gospel being for the most part accomplished at that time and its completion being inevitable today. The scripture phraseology makes it an accomplished fact. In the scriptures, we frequently meet what with what is called sinikadoshe, that is a figure of speech, whereby a part is made to stand for the whole. For instance, it is said that Christ was three days and three nights in the grave. And when the fact is he passed one entire day, two nights and portions of the other days in that place. Again, we read in Matthew 23 of Jerusalem stoning the prophets, yet a large proportion of the inhabitants were godly people. Thus, too, the ecclesiastics are said to be avaricious, but among them are many righteous men. This way of speaking is common to all languages, especially is it found in the Holy Scriptures. So the gospel was in, an, in the apostolic day preached to all creatures, for it is a message introduced, designed and ordained to reach all creatures. To illustrate, a prince having dispatched from his residence a message and seeing it started upon the way might say that the message has gone to the appointed place even though it has not yet reached its destination. Similarly, God has sent forth his gospel to all creatures even though it, is not, it has not so far reached all. Note the prophet says the voice of the apostles has gone out throughout the earth. He does not say their voice has reached the entire world but is on the way, is gone out, and so Paul means the gospel is continuously preached and made manifest to all men. It is now on the way. The act is performed, though the effect is not complete. The appearing of grace, Paul says, instructs us in two things. One is described as denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We must explain these terms. The Latin word impietas, which the apostle renders in the Greek, esibia, and which in Hebrew is risa. I cannot find any one German word to express. I have made it ungotchak wissen, ungodliness. The Latin and Greek terms do not fully convey the Hebrew meaning, risa, properly. It is the sin of fault, failing to honor God, that is, of not believing, trusting, fearing him, not surrendering to him, not submitting to his providence, not allowing him to be God. In this sin, those guilty of gross outward evils are deeply implicated indeed, but much more deeply involved are the wise, sainted, learned ecclesiasts who, relying on their works, think themselves godly and so appear in the eyes of the world. In fact, all men who do not live a life committed to the pure goodness and grace of God are impious, ungodly, even though they be holy enough to raise the dead, are perfect in continence and other virtues, graceless or faithless, 
would seem to be proper adjective to describe them. I shall, however, use the term ungodly. Paul tells us that this saving grace has appeared to the graceless to make them rich in grace and rich in God. In other words, to bring them to believe, trust, fear, honor, love, and praise him, and thus transform ungodliness into godliness. Of what use would the appearing of saving grace were to the attempt to become godly in life through some other means? Paul here declares, grace was revealed and proclaimed to the very end that we might deny ungodliness and thereafter live righteously, not through or of ourselves, but through grace. No one more disparages divine grace and more gainsays its appearing than do the hypocrites, the ungodly saints, for unwilling to regard their own works ineffectual, sinful and faulty, they discover in themselves much good. Measuring themselves by their good intentions, they imagine they deserve great merit independently of grace. God, however, regards no good work, nor is it unless he by his grace effects in it in, it in us. It was for the sake of accomplishing in us all many such works and of deterring us from our own attempts that God manifested his saving grace to men. Now the foremost evil of men is their godlessness, their unsaved state, their lack of grace. It includes first a faithless heart, and then all resolent, resolent thoughts, words, works, and conduct in general. Left to himself, the individual's inner life and outward conduct are guided only by his natural abilities and human reason. In these, his beauty and brilliance sometimes outshine the real saints, but he seeks merely his own interest. He is unable to honor God in life and conduct, even though he does command greater praise and glory and the exercise of reason than do the true saints of frequent scripture mention. So worldwide and so deeply subtle and evil is this godless, graceless conduct. It withholds from the individual the power to perceive the evil of his way, to believe he errs, even when his error is held up to him. The prophet looks upon this blindness as not that of reason or of the world or of the flesh, but as spiritual deception, leading astray not only the reason, but the spirit of man. In fact, that ungodliness is sinful, must be, must be believed rather than felt, since God permitted the manifestation of his grace to all men to lead them to deny ungodliness. We ought to believe him a being who knows our hearts better than we do ourselves. We must also confess that, that were it not for ungodliness and faulty character of our deeds, God would not have ordained the proclamation of his grace for our betterment. Were one to administer remedies to an individual not ill, he would not be looked upon as lacking sense. He would be looked upon as lacking sense. Accordingly, God must be regarded in the same light by them who, measuring themselves by good intentions and their feelings, are unwilling to believe all their deeds ungodly and worthy of condemnation, and that God's saving grace is necessary. To them, it is a terrible doctrine. Christ charges the chief priests, doctors, and ecclesiasts with disbelieving John the Baptist, who called them to repentance. They refused to know their sin. All the prophets met death for accusing the people of the sin of ungodliness. No one believed the prophets. No one of the people thought himself guilty of such sin. They judged themselves by their feelings, their intentions and works, not by God's word, not by his counsel delivered through the prophets. Paul employs a strong Greek term, pasudia, pedusia, meaning to instruct, such elementary instru instructions as we give children concerning a thing whereof they have no knowledge at all. The children are guided, not by their reason, but by the instruction, the instructing word of their father. According to his representation, they regard a certain thing as useful or harmful. They believe in and are guided by him with intellect and learned individuals. However, we explain in a way comprehensible to their reason why a certain thing is profitable 
and a certain other thing is unprofitable. Gaia designs that we as childish pupils be instructed by a saving grace. Then if we cannot feel, we may yet believe that our natures are godless and faulty and so receive grace and walk therein. Well, does Christ testify? Except you turn and become as little children, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Isaiah 7, if you will not believe, surely ye shall be, surely ye shall not be established. Divine saving grace then has appeared not only to help us, but also to teach us our need of grace. For the fact of its coming shows all our works in godless, graceless, condemned. The psalmist fervently entreats God to teach him of his judgments, laws, and commandments, that he may not be guided by his own ideas and feelings, a thing God has forbidden, saying, You shall not do every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. All right. The second evil, worldly lust. The other evil in man, Paul terms, worldly lust. Therein is comprehended all disorderly conduct the individual may be guilty of touching himself and his neighbor, while the first evil ungodliness comprehends all wrongs toward God. Observes Paul's judicious choice of words, lust, worldly lust. By use of the worldly, he would include all evil lust, whether it be for goods, luxuries, honors, favors, or aught of the world wherein one may lustfully sin. He does not say, however, we must deny ourselves worldly goods or must not make use of them. They are good creatures of God who must avail ourselves of food, drink, clothing, and other necessities of life. No such thing is forbidden. It is only the lust after them, the undue love and craving for them, that we must deny. For it leads us into all sins against ourselves and our neighbors. In this expression is also condemned the conduct of godless hypocrites who, though they may be clad in sheep's clothing and sometimes refrain from an evil deed through cowardice or shame or through fear of hell's punishment, are nevertheless filled with evil desires for wealth, honor, and power. No one loves life more dearly, fears death more terribly, and desires more ardently to remain in this world than do they. Yet they fail to recognize the worldly lusts wherein they are drowned, and their many works are vainly performed. It is not enough to put away the worldly works and speech. Worldly desires or lusts must be removed. We are not to place our affections upon the things of this life, but all our use of it should be with a view of the future life, as follows in the text, looking for the appearing of the glory, etc. Observe here the grace of God reveals the fact that all men are filled with worldly lusts though some may conceal their lustfulness by their hypocrisy. Were men not subject to such desires, there could be no necessity for the revelation of grace, no heed, no need for its benefits, no occasion for its manifestations to all men, no need it should teach for the putting off of lust. For whosoever is not subject to lust is called, called upon to forsake them. Paul's statement here has no reference to such a one. Indeed he, cannot, indeed, he cannot be a human being, hence he has no need of grace. And so far as he is concerned, its manifestation is not essential. What then must he be? Unquestionably a devil and eternally, con and eternally condemned with all his holiness and purity. Could the hypocrites, however, wholly hide their worldly lust? They cannot conceive their ardent desire to hold to this life and their unwillingness to die. Thus they reveal their lack of grace and the worldliness and the ungodliness of all their works. Nevertheless, they fail to perceive their graceless condition and their perilous infirmity. Further, Paul speaks of denying or renouncing. Therein, he rejects many foolish expedients devised by men for attaining righteousness. Some run to the wilderness, some into cloisters. Others separate themselves from society, presuming by bodily flight to run away from ungodliness and worldly lusts. Yet others resort to tortures and injuries of the body, imposing upon themselves excessive hunger, thirst, wakefulness, labor, 
and comfortable apparel. Now, if ungodliness and worldly lust were but something painted upon the wall, he might escape them by running out of the house. If they were knit into a red coat, you might pull off the coat and don a gray one. Did they grow in your hair? You might have it shaved off and wear a bald pate. Were they baked in bread? You might eat roots instead. But since they inhere in your heart and permeate through and through, where you can't, where, where can you flee? They will not carry them with you. What can you wear under? What can you wear under which will escape them? What will you eat and drink wherein they will not be with you? In the word, what can you do to escape yourself, since you cannot get out of yourself? Dear man, the great temptations are within you. To run away from them would necessitate first fleeing from yourself. James 1.14, each man is tempted when he is driven away by his own lust and enticed. The apostle means not simply that we must flee the outward temptations to sin, but as he says, we must deny them, must mortify the lusts or desires within ourselves. Our lust being mortified, no external temptation can harm, but sub subjectation do we truly flee. If we fail to mortify our desires, it will not avail to flee outward temptations. We must re remain amidst temptations and there learn through grace to deny lusts and ungodliness. It is written Psalm 110.2, Rule thou, or apply thyself, in the midst of thine enemies. Conflict and not fight. Flight, energy and not rest, must be the order in this life if we are to win the crown. We read of an ancient father who, unable to endure temptation in a cloister, left it that he might in the wilderness serve God in peace. But in the desert one day his little water jug overturned. He set it up, but it overturned a second time. Becoming enraged, he dashed the vessel into pieces, then saying within himself, Since I cannot find peace when alone, the defect must be in myself. He returned to the cloister to suffer temptations. From that time forward, teaching that we must obtain the victory, not by fleeing worldly lust, but by denying them. The Christian life. Paul goes on to show another thing wherein we are instructed of, grace. The Christian's manner of life, after ungodliness and worldly lusts are denied, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. What an excellent general rule of life he gives us, one adapted to all conditions. He offers no occasion for sex. Sex. He introduces no differing opinions of men, as is the case with human doctrine. First, he mentions soberness, wherein is indicated what should be the nature of man's conduct toward himself in all respects. It calls for the subjection of the body by keeping it well disciplined. In every place of our text where the term soberness is used, Paul has used the Greek word sophron, which signifies not only soberness, but temperance in every recognition of the body and every ministration into the flesh. In eating, drinking, and sleeping, for instance, in apparel, speech, manner, and movement, such soberness represents what is known in German as honorable living and good breeding. The sober man knows how, in all physical relations, to conduct himself temperately, discreetly and bravely, not, not leading a wild, shameless, unrestrained, disorderly life, lax in regard to eating, drinking, sleeping, and to speech, manner of movement. In the early part of the chapter, Paul devises that an aged woman teaches the young woman to be sober-minded and chaste. Excessive eating and drinking truly does greatly impede our efforts to lead an honorable life. On the other hand, temperance contributes much to accomplish it. The moment one indulges his appetite to excess, he loses perfect control of himself. His five senses become unmanageable. Experience teaches that when the stomach is filled with meat and drink, the mouth is filled with world, words, the ears with the lust of hearing, the eyes with the lust of seeing. The whole system either becomes indolent, drowsy, dull, or, ex or else it grows wild and dissolute. All the, member all the members overleaping the bounds of reason and propriety until no discipline or moderation remains. The word in our text, therefore, is not inaptly Latinized sobrius, soberness. In Greek, the term sophron is the opposite of esotos, just as the German volere and megziskit 
Drunkenness and soberness are contrasting terms. Examine the Latin sobrius. We find it does not signify total abstinence from food and drink. Sobrius and ebris are also contrasting terms, like the German trunkenheit or volere and neukenschreit, drunkenness or ebriety and soberness. We Germans also call that individual nuketern sober, who though they may have eaten and drunk is not intoxicated, but has perfect control of himself. You see now the manner of good works advocated by the apostle. He does not require us to make pilgrimages. He does not forbid certain foods, nor does he, nor does he prescribe a particular garb, nor certain fast days. He teaches it is not that of the class who in obedience to human laws separate themselves from men, basing their spirituality and goodness upon the peculiarity of their garb and diet, their manner of wearing the hair, their observance of times who seek to become righteous by not conforming to the custom and the manner of clothing, diet, occupation, seasons, and movements. They are given an appropriate name in the gospel. Pharisee, meaning excluded or separated. In Psalm 80, the prophet calls them monios, signifying a solitary one. The name primary is applied to a wild hog or solitary habits. We shall hereafter designate this class of so solitary, as the psalmist complains that they make terrible havoc of God's vineyard. These Pharisees or solitary ones make great show with their traditions, their peculiar garb, their meats, days, and physical attitudes. They easily draw away the multitude from the common customs of life to their ways. As Christ tells us, even the elect can scarce resist them. Let us learn here from Paul that no meats, drinks, apparel, colors, times, attitudes are forbidden, and none are prescribed. In all these things, everyone is given freedom. If only they be used in soberness or moderation, as said before, these temporalities are not forbidden. Only the abuse of them, only excess and disorder therein is prohibited. Where there is distinction and emphasis on such matters, there you will surely find human laws, not evangelical doctrine, not Christian liberty. Without soberness or moderation, the ultimate result must be dissimulation and hy hypocrisy. Therefore, make use of all earthly things when and where you please, giving thanks to God. This is Paul's teaching. Only guard against excess, disorder, misuse, and lic licentiousness relative to temporal things, and you will be in the right way. Do not permit yourself to be misled by the fact that the Holy Fathers establish orders and sects, make use of them meet, of certain meats and certain apparel, and conduct themselves thus and so. Their object was not peculiar eminence, therein they would have not been unholy, but their conduct was of preference and a means for exercising moderation. Likewise, do you exercise moderation as you see fit? and maintain your freedom. Confine not yourself to manners and methods as if godly living consisted in them. Otherwise you will be solitary and deprived of the communion of saints. Diligently guard against such narrowness. We must fast, we must, must watch and labor, we must wear inferior clothing, and so on. But only on occasions when the body seems to need to restrain and mortification. Do not set apart a specified time and place but exercise your self-denial as nece necessity requires. Then you will be fasting rightly. You will fast every day in denying worldly lust. So the gospel teaches, and they who follow this course are of the New Testament dispensation. Secondly, Paul says we should be righteous in our lives. No work, however, nor peculiar time is here designated as the way to righteousness. In the ways of the in the ways of God is universal freedom. It is left to the individual to exercise his liberty, to do when and where and whom occasion offers. Here Paul gives a hint of how we should conduct ourselves toward our neighbor, righteously. We owe him that righteousness was consist in doing to him as we would have done to us, and granting to him all we would have him grant us. We are to do our neighbor no bodily harm, no injury to his wife, children, friends, possessions, honor, or anything of his whether we are obligated, wherever we see he needs our assistance to aid him, to stand by him at the risk of our bodies, our property, our honor, and everything that is ours. 
Righteousness consists in rendering to each one his due. What little word to comprehend so much. How few walk in this way of righteousness, though otherwise living blamelessly. We do everything else, but saving grace reveals to us as our duty to do. The word neighbor must be constructed to include even enemy. But the way of righteousness is entirely obliterated. It is much more overgrown and neglect than the way of moderation, which itself is almost unholy, untrodden, and efficacist because of the induction of certain meats and apparel, certain movements and display. These things have been superabundantly more than profusely insulated. We ape after set forms and make fools of ourselves with rosaries, with the ecclesiastical and feudal institutions, with hearing of masses, with festivals, with self-devised works of concerning which no divine command. O oh Lord God, how well has our, how wide hell has opened her mouth and how narrow has the gate of heaven become in consequence to the accursed doctrines and devices of these solitary and pharisaical, pharisaical persons. The prophets unwittingly paint the picture of present day conditions. They represent hell by a, by a wide open mouth of a dragon heaven by a closed door. Oh, the wretchedness of the picture. It is not necessary to inquire what outward works you can perform. Look to your neighbor. There really you will find enough to do. A thousand kind offices to render. Do not suffer yourselves to be misled into believing you will reach heaven by praying and attending church, by contributing to institutions and movements while you pass by your neighbor. If you pass him in this life, he will lot lie in your way in the life to come and cause you to go by the door of heaven as did the rich man who left Lazarus lying at the gate. Woe to us priests, monks, bishops, and the Pope. What do we preach? What teach? How we lead the pitiable multitude from the way, the blind leading the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Such doctrines as Paul declared in the conclusion of this lesson. These are what we should teach. In the third place, we are taught we must lead godly lives. Here we are reminded of how to conduct ourselves toward God. Now we are fully instructed concerning our duty to ourselves, to our neighbors, and to God. As before said, impiety signifies wickedness and ungodliness, lack of grace. Piety, on the other hand, means having faith, godliness, grace. Godly living consists in trusting God and relying on his grace alone regarding no work, no wrought in us by him. Through grace, if we are godly, we will recognize honor and adore, and adore, praise, and love God. Briefly in two words, to live godly is to fear and trust God, as it is written, Jehoshaphat taketh pleasure in him that fear him, and those that hope in his loving kindness. To fear God is to look upon our own devices as pure ungodliness in the light of his man, manifest grace. These being ungodly, we are to fear God and forsake them, and thereafter guard against them. To trust in God is to have perfect confidence that we will be, that he will be gracious to us, filling us with grace and godliness. The individuals yield to God when he gives himself wholly to God, attempting nothing of himself but, but permitting the Lord to work in and rule him. When his whole concern and fear, his continual prayer and desire are for God from God, are for God to withhold him from following his own works and ways, which he now recognizes as ungodly and deserving of wrath, and to rule over and work in him through grace. Thus the individual will, obtain, will obtain a clear conscience and will love and praise God. Observed they are the pious and, and filled with grace, who do not walk by reason, but trust in human nature, but rely only on the grace of God, ever fearfully lest they fall from grace into dependence upon their own reason their self-conceit, good intention, and self-devised works. The theme of the entire 119th Psalm is trust in God. In every one of his 176 verses, David breathes the same prayer. Reliance upon God is, is a subject of such vital importance, and so numerous are the difficulties and dangers attending human nature and reason and human doctrine. We cannot be too much on our guard. The way of God does not require us to build churches and cathedrals, to make pilgrimage, or hear, to hear mass, and so on. God requires a heart moved by his grace. 
God requires a heart moved by his grace, a life mistrustful of all ways not emanating from grace. Nothing more can render God than such loyalty. All else is rather his gift to us. He says, in effect, think not, O Israel, I inquire after thy gifts and offerings, for everything in heaven and earth is mine. This is the service I require of thee, to offer unto me a thanksgiving and pay thy vows. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. In other words, thou hast vowed that I should be thy God. Then keep this vow. Let me work, perform thine own works. Let me help thee in thy need. For everything look to me. Let me alone direct thy life. Then wilt thou be able to know me and my grace, to love and praise me. This is the true road to salvation. If thou, if thou doest otherwise, performing thine own works, thou wilt give thyself praise. Wilt disregard me and refuse to accept me as thy God. Thou wilt prove treacherous and break thy vow. Note, such, such obedience to God is real, divine service. For this service, we need no bells nor churches, no vessels nor ornaments. Lights and candles are not necessary. Neither are organs and singing, images and pictures, tables and altars. We require not bald pates nor caps, not intent, incense nor sprinkling, nor processions nor handling of the cross. Neither are indulgences nor briefs essential. All these are human inventions, mere matters of taste. God does not regard them, and too often they obscure with their glitter and true service of God. Only one thing is necessary to write service, the gospel. Let the gospel be properly urged, though let it, though it let divine service be made known to the people. God is the true bell, the true organ for divine service. Further, Paul says we are to live as he describes in this present world. First, the perfect life cannot be accomplished by works. Our whole life, while we remain here, must be sober, righteous, and godly. Christ promises, he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Now there are some who, it must be admitted, occasionally accomplish good, but occasional accomplishment is not here com a complete life of goodness, nor does it mean endurance to the end. Second, no one can afford to leave this matter of godly life until death or until another world is reached. Whatever we would have in the life to come must be secured here. Many depend upon purgatory, living as it, living as it pleases them to the end and expecting to profit by vigils and soul masses after death. Truly, they will fail to reach to receive profit therein. It were well as purgatory never had been conceived of. Belief in purgatory suppresses much good, establishes many cloisters and monasteries, and employs numerous priests and monks. It's a serious drawback to these that three features of Christian living, soberness, righteousness, and godliness. Moreover, God has not commanded nor even mentioned purgatory. The doctrine is holy or, for the most part, deception. God, pardon me if I am wrong, it is, to say the least, dangerous to accept, to build upon, anything not designated by God, when it is all we can do to stand in building upon the institutions of God which can never waver. The injunction of Paul to live rightly in this present world is truly a severe tr trust at pur thrust at purgatory. He would not have us jeopardize our faith, not that I, at this late day, when we write in 1522, deny the existence of purgatory, but it is dangerous to preach it. Whatever of truth there may be in the doctrine, because the word of God, the scriptures make no mention of purgatory. Paul's chief reason, however, for making use of the phrase in this present world is to emphasize the power of God's saving grace. In the extreme wickedness of the world, the godly person is as one alone, unexampled as it were, a rose among thorns. Therefore, he must endure every form of misfortune, of censure, shame, and wrong. The apostle's thought is, he who would live soberly, righteously, and godly must expect to meet all manner of enmity and must take upon the cross. He must not allow himself to be misled, even though he has, he has to live alone, like Lot in Sodom and Abraham in Canaan, among none of the 
among none but the gluttonous, the drunken, the incontinent, unrighteous, false, and ungodly. His environment is his environment is world and must remain world. He has to resist and overcome the enticements of earth, censoring worldly desires. To live right in this present world, mark you, is like living soberly in a saloon, chastely in a brothel, ungodly in a gaiety hall, uprightly in a den of murders. The character of the world is such as to render our earthly life difficult and distressing until we longly cry out for death in the day of judgment and await them with ardent desire. As the next clause in the text indicates, life being subject to so many evils, it is only hope in being led by grace. Human nature and reason are at a loss to direct it. Looking for blessed hope. With these words, the apostle makes the go godly life clearly distinct from every other life. Here the, first, here the text that enables one to perceive how he measures up to the life of grace. Let all pr who presume to think they live godly step forward and answer as to whether or not they delight in this hope as pictured here whether they are so prepared for the day of judgment that they await it with pleasure, whether they regard it as more endurable and even blessed event to be contemplated with longing and with cheerful confidence. It is not true that a human nature ever shrinks from judgment. It is not true that if the advent of that day rested upon the world's pleasure in the matter, it would never come. And particularly in the case of the hypocritical saints, where then does human nature stand? Where reason? Where are the free will so much extolled as inclined to and potent for good? Why does free will not only flee from good, but shrink from that honor to the God of salvation, which the apostle here refers to as blessed hope? And in which hope we shall be blessed? What is to prevent the conclusion here that they who shrink from the judgment lead lead lives of impious, blamable, and devoid of grace, the evils and ungodliness of which they might, but for the approach of that day, conceal. What is more ungodly than to strive against God's will? But it is not, but it is not that just what the individual does, who would flee from the day of, from the day wherein the honor of God shall be revealed, who does not await the event with loving and joyful heart. Mark you, then, he who desires not that day does not, does not with delight and with love to God await it, is not living a godly life, not, not though he is able to raise the dead, not though he is able to raise the dead. Then it must be, then it must be you, then it must be, you say, that few lead godly lives particularly among those solitary spiritual ones who above all men flee death and judgment. That is just as that is just what I have said. These separated individuals simply lead themselves and others from the true path, obliterating the ways marked out by God. Plainly, we see how little reason in nature can accomplish. They but strive against God, and we see how necessary is saving grace. For when our own works are abandoned, God comes and alone works in us, enabling us to rise from ourselves, from our ungodly conduct, to a supernatural, grace-filled, godly life. Then we not only do not fear the day of judgment, but cheerfully, even longingly, await, await it, contemplating it with joy and pleasure. This point has been further treated in the gospel lesson for the second Sunday in Advent. True godliness, you note, is not taught by human nature or mortal reason, but by the manifest grace of God. By grace, we are enabled to deny worldly lusts, even to feel aversion to them, to desire liberation from them, to be dissatisfied with our manner of life in general. More than that, it creates in us disposition essential to godliness, a disposition to entreat God with perfect confidence and to await with pleasing his coming. So, so, we, so we should be disposed. Now let us cheerfully weigh the words, blessed hope. A contrast is presented to the misery, miserably unhappy life wherein we attempt to walk uprightly. We are only harassed by misfortune, danger, and sin. All in this life serves but to vex 
while we have every reason to be encouraged in that hope. Such is the experience of them who earnestly endeavor to live soberly, righteously, and godly. The world cannot long endure this class. It soon regards them as repulsive, Paul testifies. We also rejoice in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation works steadfastness, and steadfastness approvedness, and approvedness hope, and putteth not to shame. Thus our eyes remain closed on the worldly, invisible, and open to the eternal and indivisible. All this transformed condition is the work of grace through the cross, which we must endure if we attempt to lead a godly life, the life of the world, the life the world cannot tolerate. An appearing of the glory. Paul's words for Advent here is epidaphian, appearing or manifestation. Similarly, he spoke above of the appearance or manifestation of grace. The word Advent in the Latin, therefore, does not express all. The apostle. Hey. Hello. Hello.